Welcome to Arbitral Insights, a podcast series brought to you by our international arbitration practice lawyers here at Reed Smith. I'm Peter Rocha, Global Head of Reed Smith's International Arbitration Practice. I hope you enjoy the industry commentary, insights and anecdotes we share with you in the course of this series, wherever in the world you are. If you have any questions about any of the topics discussed, please do contact our speakers. And with that, let's get started. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the latest edition of our Arbitral Insight podcast series. And I'm delighted today to have as our guest, Rekha Rangachari. Hello, Rekha. Hi there, Gautam. It's wonderful to have you. I've been looking forward to doing this podcast with you for a long time. Um, I remember uh, when you and I shared uh, a platform at the PLI conference in New York City at the beginning of June this year. And I had the very good fortune to share a platform with you. And I did tell you in, at the end of that that uh, um, I'd be looking forward to doing a podcast with you. And here we are. So now, for those of you who don't know Rekha, Rekha is the executive director of the New York International Arbitration Center based in New York. Uh, the NYIAC, for short, was founded in, in 2013 and is a very important institution based in Midtown Manhattan. Prior to joining the NYIAC, Rekha was the director of ADR services for the New York Commercial Division of the AAA International Center for Dispute Resolution. And she is is very experienced in a number of jurisdictions and um, is a real flag carrier for the New York International Arbitration Center. And she's also uh, incredibly in, um, involved on many, many levels in several aspects of diversity, equity, and inclusion, a topic record we'll return to in the course of this podcast. But suffice it to say, for the time being, record is prolific in many, many aspects of the essential activities that go on in diversity, equity, and inclusion. And she's a very uh, active member of Arbitral Women and also uh, Racial Equality for Arbitration Lawyers. So on that footing, I could go on record because you've got a resume to make many blush. But um, I'm going to say again, welcome, Rekha. I'm delighted to have you as uh, our podcast guest, and I'm much looking forward to our discussion. Gautam, I'm blushing on this end. I have to uh, bring you along and give introductions for me. It was really, really gracious uh, for the invitation. Thanks to you and to Lucy and the team at Reed Smith running these arbitral insights. Really, really a great addition to the arbitration landscape. And I think podcasts are really the way to go. We're all talking in real time. We're reading in real time. But it's fun to sit down with your friends and have these chats. So thanks again. Wonderful. No, thank you. And look forward to our discussion. So. So, Rekha, let's go back to where it all started. So, when did uh, law discover you, or when did you discover law? I, I like this question, right? It's a kind of romance, how we finesse and find the law and let it well, into our yeah, lives. Yeah. In a, Something in like that, absolutely, yes. <laughs> uh, it's not always nice to us every day, uh, nor are we to it, I guess. But, uh, you know, I started at law school at a time when in the United States there was this big growth of specialized alternative dispute resolution and arbitration curricula. And so it's with that mindset that I got to take arbitration courses, foundational courses with some of the greats. And then of course, as many may say, as an addendum, I became a Vis Moody, you know, they're after a Vis coach. But after matriculation and graduation, I ended up working at boutique international arbitration law firms, taking deep dives into the international law and investor state landscape. Um, And so it's really this sort of, how did the law find me? Um, I'm grateful that it did to the coursework, but then being a Vis Moody, (laughs) proudly wearing that badge, and then going on to be able to concretize that in my work life has been a really fabulous addition, um, to be totally honest. And it it was from there and sort of those stints early on that I ended up really materializing my institutional role um, in the arbitration space in New York. Thank you, Rekha. And in terms of arbitration, you know, when did that as a practice area really hit your radar? I mean, are there certain moments you can look back on and say, that's when arbitration got me or 
and or were there people that you worked with, any, any particular individuals who really sparked your interest in the subject area? You know, I think early on it was professors in law school, but then I spent a stint at a Dutch law firm. Um, and I remember then working with a mentor of mine who became a good friend. Um, and she would often say, how did you end up here? And I said, because we had these chats. And remember during the Vismut, you said, let's have a coffee. And you wanted to make sure I was sane and normal. So if you brought me over for a bit, that we would not only <laughs> work hard, but have some good fun. Um, but it's in those early days, I think, of um, seizing adventure and opportunities and having the kind of people that believed in me to give me those opportunities that reminded me the space was really special, that uh, people were open-minded about bringing on different kinds of talent across jurisdictions to come work on matters. Um, and how important that was, I think, in the early days has reminded me that it's so important to keep being open-minded about that as I meet um, young young folks, um, students new to the practice, as well as young practitioners, because in the same way folks open the door for us, uh, we continue to do it. I think this other idea, though, right, who has the luxury of getting to cross cultures and landscapes um, and as well across jurisdictions of practice. It's in this space that we get to do it and what a luxury it is. And so I can't imagine being anywhere else. But it's not always that the law finds you in that way and you're able to embrace it simultaneously. So gratitude is part of that beyond just working hard and making those opportunities happen. Yeah, no, thank you. And I remember reading uh, many years ago that we do not grace the legal profession the legal profession graces us. And I, and I think, and that's such an important saying, I think that keeps us all incredibly grounded and makes us think about where it all started and how we got to where we got to, who helped us on that road and who continues to help us on that road. So no, thank you for those thoughts, Rekha. Um, now, I, I just want to spend a little bit of time on the New York International Arbitration Center because whilst everyone will know New York, one of the world's truly great cities and an incredibly important arbitration center. Um, not all of our listeners will be that familiar with the New York International Arbitration Center. So I wonder whether you could just spend a couple of minutes just telling us why arbitrating in New York is so effective and is, is, is a really good idea for consumers of arbitration? Sure. And I'm glad we start sort of at the basics because I can't tell you um, how often people will say, I'd like to be on your roster, Reka, at NIAC, or um, it would be interesting to learn more about NIAC to be able to put you into our arbitral clause, which uh, neither of which is really great unless we're talking venue, right? So a decade ago, we're ce celebrating our decennial year this year, um, a decade ago, NIAC was formed with this idea that we needed to focus in on New York as a jurisdiction, the application of law, New York as a seat, um, as well as New York as a venue whereby which we have hearing space um, to support the practice. Um, and in doing all of that, in being sort of a brand manager for New York and its nascent ears, the idea was how, how do we do that, right? We're an arbitral institution, an NGO that does not administer cases because at the time when we were coming into formation, there were already several arbitral institutions, not only in New York or in the US, but broadly, globally, there was many. So why compete with that marker? Um, and so it was to carve out a special and safe space to deal with all these things and thought leadership we wanted to do. And I have trouble when folks ask, ask me, give me a parallel to what NIAC is in the space. Because I don't think there's exactly something on point, a brick and mortar space, in addition, that's pushing all of this content, and that is privately supported by law firms, the leading law firms with international arbitration practices in New York. So let's begin there, right? What is the construct? We're privately funded now in our 10th year. We're also funded not only by the law firms, but also by economists and third party funders. This idea of how do you bring the stakeholders together? Um, to do it better overall. But that question you asked of why is New York so important? Why was there even this impetus to bring everyone together and to focus in on New York is that I think 
here in New York, we have a really fluid sphere of commerce-driven substantive law. If we look to the Americas and to some of the arbitral institutional rules and statistics they publish each year, New York leads for the U.S., not only for application of law, but also as a seat. And, and that says something um, about the tenacity, I think, of why people choose New York time and time again, why they want to come here from a stability factor, from a deep bench, not only of practitioners, but of judges that get it right, that understand the law. And then we have this community. Um, and I, I think all of those elements become really important. You know, the truth of it is, here out of New York, a financial capital of the world, we want to create the best. We want to have a neutral venue. We want to have all these elements of the arbitral process that are getting better and at the best in class year to year. And, and so how do we do that? And I think it's constantly coming together as a community to think about that. But if you already start with a product that is phenomenal, New York, and I'll use that largely, um, and with humor, then it's easy to sell it because it's already a believed in product. It's a reliable product. And so we can keep building from that with momentum as we place ourselves in the global community and keep doing better with our peers and our friends and our supporters. Thank you. And, and certainly New York, it, as you say, is a very important part of the arbitration jigsaw. And you know, many people often think about Miami in the U.S., undoubtedly a very important center but then you know new york is incredibly important too and um you know i think that's been been very helpful thank you for putting that into context awesome just i mm. wanted to add something that occurred to oh, me as, as i was thinking you know to me sometimes as much as i joke it's a brand manager i become a brand manager for new york and all things new york as it pertains to the law and the seat and the venue i think about the three p's we have a great product a great place and great promotion, NIAC being at its 10 year mark, we're in our adolescence, but we also are in our fifth year of New York arbitration. And I think those things coming together really make New York and there with NIAC shine in a really phenomenal way, but allow us to keep doing the work we're doing, allow us to keep growing year to year in membership and taking stock of where we're at with feedback from the community, which is really special because you don't always get that in every spot or role that you come into. And I do find that NIAC is this centripetal force. People come through our doors because they come to visit New York. They come to meet with friends. Students come in and they meet sometimes folks that will later interview them for their first job. And so although we're a big community, like other big seats in arbitration, at the end of the day, it is a small community because everyone gets to know one another. Um, and that counts. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, and it's the collective effort as you say, of all those stakeholders, that, that really makes the success. These things don't happen by accident. Um, they happen because they're purposeful and because people are passionate about them. So it's great to see the, I mean, you know, um, I like that phrase where you said the New York Center is, is in its adolescence. I, no, I like that. So there's um, still some growing to do, which is always good to know. Let's turn to uh, a slightly different topic now, which, uh, which I know is very close to your heart. It's very close to my heart. Uh, and that's true and better uh, diversity, equity and inclusion. And I mentioned in my opening that uh, you are a real flag bearer for so many important aspects of diversity in all its forms, from the perspective of an ethnic diversity, uh, from gender diversity, but also truly being inclusive. And I just wonder if you could share some of your thoughts about, oh, we know that it's important. I mean, that's a given. But tell us a little bit more about how you think these sorts of concepts, these critical concepts that are so important, can be really more ingrained, better pursued, better mobilized, and just better established in everything we do? Sure. I mean, that's a broad question. So let's maybe start with something that is sort of at the core of the way I look at all of this. And honestly, it's good fun to be able to do this kind of work with colleagues like you, because I think we all share this abundance mindset. It's not a scarcity mindset, right? So the pie, it's growing bigger and that we can share 
I think it begins there, but also this idea of the world is so complicated. We work in these complicated spaces as well with our legal regimen and trying to buttress these different access points. And so how can we make things simple where we can? That simplicity goes to something like opening a door, right? Much as how we got our first access points into the law. And so I think it starts there. If I look to how do we do it and what underscores uh, what we're building, it's access and sharing the spotlight with humility. It's building opportunities. And then it's helping folks, including ourselves, because as we do it for others, we have to remember sometimes to do it for ourselves, the brand management factor, because you can do all of the work. But if you never tell anybody about it in knowledge sharing, then do folks know you've done it? Do they know that they can count upon you or call upon you? Um, and so you named it two groups that are really special to me um, that I feel so fortunate to be a part of in their leadership realities is Arbitral Women and Real. Arbitral Women was founded in 1993. So we're celebrating this year, 30 years strong. And we've been having different events sort of across the globe, um, getting folks together as Arbitral Women started in its foundational year and years of just raising a glass, right? Agnostic to gender. Um, but really, because it takes a community to build access, getting together and doing that. And we have our big celebration um, coming up. We did one during London Disputes Week, uh, where the president lives. Um, and then we'll do one in Paris, which is the home of the organization. Um, and so, you know, the network of arbitral women is some 1,000 members strong across 40 countries. And that's really phenomenal, constantly thinking about how we're going to map better how we're going to expand, but at its core, how are we going to connect people? It's the humanity that allows us to keep building these bridges and making those friendships and then remembering to reach out. And I was struck by something, you know, uh, recently at an Arbitral Women Breakfast we held at Istanbul Arbitration Week. Um, we were talking a lot about how, okay, it's the 100th anniversary of the, the Turkish Republic. A lot of change is happening in that region, but it's also remarkable that across several in-house teams, construction teams in Turkey, women were leading the charges, if not the majority, making up the legal departments. And so we see that the landscape is changing. It's not without its own issues, but to see that kind of progress, to have these conversations and this sort of spark, it's why I think we do the work we do, or we do the extracurriculars that we do where time is limited. It's the same way with Real. You know, we founded Real during a time of pandemic when there was a lot happening in the world. And it was this idea of how do you give access? How do you talk about topics that are often not at the front and center, in spite of the fact that we all generally come from myriad cultures, speaking myriad languages, and even of myriad nationalities, if we can hold multiple, how do we talk about that identity factor? We talk about it often in the context of how we can help our client. But what about how we connect with one another in that space about these identity politics? And then how do you talk about intersectionality? And we, we found it hard to figure out a way we could do it. And so Real was born, a group of friends that got together and tried to figure out how can we do it across our jurisdictions that were representative and then beyond that um, to just open up the space to conversation that may be uncomfortable. But simultaneously, as a brand management, if you are speaking somewhere, send it to Real and we'll post it. Let's have a newsletter spotlighting people. Let's do things anchored not only to race, but intersectional diversity, to talk broadly about diversity, thinking and heralding back to Arbitral Women and the success it had, and it has still to this day, to talk about gender, to do it of a different thread of diversity and more broadly. And so I keep learning the more I meet people across the globe through work and conferences. They keep teaching us how we can do it better, um, as well as the pain points that exist endemic to the society, our global arbitral society, and that we just have to keep trying harder. It's not gone, in spite of having multitudes of diversity sessions at any arbitration week or at any conference. The question becomes, is it really moving the needle? And if it's not, how are we going to pivot to keep moving that needle farther instead of just making it a common topic that we accept, but it fails to create change? And so I think these are the things we're talking about a lot and we're coalescing. And it's so 
important that things are changing. We have to track that. We have to understand it. And we have to also accept that country to country, jurisdiction to jurisdiction, change is different. Um, and the way we talk about things is different. And that cultural consciousness is so important, not only to our practice, but about how we'll improve the practice overall. Absolutely. Well, I mean, that was, um, that was fabulous. I, I agree completely on everything you've said. And I think, you know, the dialogue is so important, keeping these issues up front, having uncomfortable conversations, questioning, challenging, testing why things don't look different, why they aren't different why certain people aren't getting opportunities, why these things aren't happening, why they should happen. You know, it's not a club for some people. It's a broad place where all talents should be recognized and represented and allowed to shine. So I honestly couldn't say any better than you, Rekha. And, uh, you know, you said it from the heart. And I, and I know how important this concept is to you and me and to many others, where these things aren't just about business, they're personal. And, um, you know, thank you for being so candid in your thoughts there. And, um, you know, I think one of the things that I always uh, find interesting is what more can institutions do? And I know that many of them do a lot in this respect, but, but what more can they do to really, as you say, move the needle on ensuring better representation of diverse arbitrators and diverse tribunal secretaries? Are there any particular initiatives which uh, your institution, the New York institution, has or puts in play to highlight these sorts of issues? Sure. So I'll take that both at the NIAC level, but broader. Um, so, you know, even at NIAC, the representative leaders, those who lead the practice group that are phenomenal leaders that have built these practices um, and really um, been thoughtful about what leadership means and, and how they're going to build it in nuanced ways. It doesn't mean that our board wasn't in some aspects monochromatic. Um, and so we had to think about, okay, how do we build even in a New York board deeper, more thoughtfully to give people space at the boardroom table? And it came from discussions with our board members of let's create an alternate director seat in addition to the director seat. Let's amend the bylaws. Let's bring in talent and allow each firm to pick alternates as apropos, but while simultaneously and in parallel signing off on a diversity and inclusion policy that has become part of the landscape of NIAC. Um, and so I think because of that, we've been able to do it better, that we have intentional leadership across our NIAC firms, and they're not flying by leadership by the seat of their pants, nor in their practice, nor in their role at NIAC. But through that intentional, informed, and thoughtful practice, we're doing it better on our board by representation as a beginning point. To other initiatives that you ask about, you know, I often say there is all of this content out there, but do people know how to access it unless you're in the inner circles because you work on those organizations? So, for example, at the ERA pledge, and I can't herald that group enough, Arbitral Women works a lot with the pledge. As part of that, there's a nominations committee. So you can send an email if you go on the ERA pledge to a generalized email nominations and you can pull it from the website. But if you send an email there, it goes to some 20 plus leaders of arbitral institutions, organizations, and law firms. And you put in the criteria of who, what kind of an arbitrator you're looking for from a diversity, gender diversity standpoint, and, and you give all of those parameters. And then together, we will consult one another and we'll proffer you a list within a timeline that you provide that's quick. But everyone is working together to say, if you can't find the candidates you're looking for, come to us. How many people know about that, that they can write in there? I found it's less than I thought because I thought it was obvious. Of course, they would go to the pledge. But we need to do a better job of marketing that tool because it's there and it is really useful. Even the Arbitral Women membership database is an open network where you can go and search for women, either to connect with, to serve as arbitrators and the like, but without it being behind a paywall, right? And so it's these sort of things that I think overall, they've been promoted, but we can do better so that that intel is in the right hands when people need it. 
Um, and we've been doing it a lot by word of mouth as well. But how do you concretize all those resources somewhere? Where do you put them? Is it about putting them all over the place? So the more people see it, the more they remember, and then they activate on it. And it, it must be that we're in a in a moment of information overload. We have been in this moment, I think, coming out of the pandemic, right? So how do you get people to stop, listen, and digest so that when they need the resource, they have it? And that's something I think about a lot, especially as I go around wearing the Arbitral Women banner and trying to talk to folks about how we can do it differently, how we can do it better. And they say, I don't know how to find X, Y, or Z information. Well, then we need to figure out how to share that broadly, better, uh, so that it's in and equipped with the right people so they can take it forward. Well, you do a great job, and I'm going to use uh, my license as podcast host to just say what a fabulous job I know you do, and because you really are a really big voice and a big presence on all of these issues, and the work that you so wonderfully do, along with many others, has real impact. It really has. I have and to commend you it, back here, Gautam. It's not a small circle, right? We have to just think, just keep growing our circle. And I really mean it's it. Good, it's good, yeah. It's, it's good fun to be able to do it with friends. Oh, Because absolutely. we all get it. We all get that yeah. we have to keep doing our part because that's how we're in this space and we stay in it. And mm. so we have, to, we have to hold true to that line. Absolutely. And it's just important to just keep on keeping on because... This thing isn't just going to happen overnight. It takes a lot of work, a lot of effort, a lot of persistence. Uh, but um, no, no, I'm just really overjoyed to see everything that you and others are doing. And and if people like you and I can contribute to this important cause, you know, that's uplifting in itself. So thank you for everything you do. Now, as we approach the end of the podcast, Rekha, and you and you know from our previous interactions that I can go on for a long time if I was given the chance to, but we are coming to the end of this podcast, and I've incredibly enjoyed speaking with you on so many of these things we've discussed. But what we do do, Rekha, as I think you know, uh, is we always end our podcast with a bit of a light-hearted set of questions. Not about law, not about arbitration, not about New York, not about London, that sort of stuff, but just some fun questions. So uh, I'm going to make no exception this time, and I'm going to ask you some questions. Uh, so tell us, so that our listeners get to know you a little bit better in terms of your non-law stuff. Um, is there a, a particular band or type of music or singer that you, that you particularly enjoy, or even plural? Uh, tell us about that. Sure. Uh, well, so <laughs> I listen to all sorts of music, um, and I grew up in a very musical household. My, I grew up in Chicago, which is uh, the blues capital, a blues capital, oh, yes, groups like yes. Muddy Waters. My dad was very much into, even as young children, taking my sister and I to the jazz clubs if we could go. They were a bit uh, lighter on letting us in, you know, in the 80s than they might be now. <laughs> I'm sure, I'm um, sure. <laughs> and so I, I think that informed a lot that and as well, I was a penis, classical penis by training. And so I just remember growing up in an environment that was fully rhythmic and fully technicolor in the arts. Um, and so um, I will say I listen to most music. I love going to concerts whenever I can. And I think it's one of the beauties of living in Manhattan that you get the luxury to to step out there and go to the theater and go to bands. The truth is, <laughs> I don't. I don't have one band in particular, but I will say um, I used to I used to hold claim that I listen to everything but country. And then friends have shown me some country, perhaps some twang from Taylor Swift. Or yeah. otherwise, and I said, OK, OK, I guess I listen to that, too. Um, if it has a good beat, um, I'm, I'm down for it. So uh, broad, broad musical appetite. If you find yourself in New York and I say this to our podcast listeners, but got some to you as well. And we have a chance to go listen to some music. I'll bring to the table a few choices, <laughs> but uh, and they'll all I'm each be di- distinct. Uh, but I may mandate even more so than the listening of the music, which I know we'll have fun with. But that we eat of that cuisine and then go, we sort of get ensconced in the culture of it and just have a night out of good food and good music. Which I know in many cities you can do it. New York is tops as well for that. So mm. uh, let, let's make it a combined reality. Well, I'm booking my ticket to New York immediately, and I shall look forward to that. And that would be a superb night out, I know, because New York, I've been, I've have had the great privilege of being, to of having visited New York uh, many, many, many times over the years. 
and uh, it's a wonderful city with a lot of choice. And so I'm sure you as a Manhattan resident would know exactly where to go. So brilliant. Now, uh, what about travel? I mean, you know, you travel a lot in your work with NIAC, but um, if you think about something for purely leisure, so not business, is there one place that you really love to visit? It's again a tough question, right? There are all these uh, people with countdowns of how many countries or cities they've been to. I personally don't keep that. But in my head, the beauty of the world is you get to keep seeing, right? This idea of let's seek out creativity. Let's be open to change. I mean, my uh, family heritage is India. I certainly love going back there um, to see my family. But I think there are certain places in particular countries that I anchor to because I believe much like as I grew up and visiting my family in India. Um, and it's not one culture, it's many cultures that do this, but I think both Italy and Spain have done, taught me very well with, make sure the table is fully loaded with food. I, I think I'm anchoring here to food and community, but yeah, <laughs> make sure the yeah. table is fully loaded with food. Make sure you have great friends, new, old, chosen, given around the table with you. And the laughter better be uh, top notch in addition to the music. But I have visited Italy and Spain a lot over the years, um, and I tend to go to those restaurants also in the city. So maybe it's those two countries that I find have an affinity, but really wherever you can have a big crowd um, and a big community and good food, I'll be there. And so if you have recommendations, I'll take them, but uh, I imagine I'll see you in one of those sites. (laughs) I'm sure we will. I know we've got that in common, too, in terms of things we love to do. So that's uh, great. Now, you know, I'm not going to I'm going to ask you a different question to the one I was going to ask you to close, which shows that these things are not scripted. Right. So I'm going to because I didn't realize that you're a trained pianist. And I've always been fascinated by singer songwriters who play the piano. Right. I've got a few songs that I think are amazing piano songs is there one piano song that you particularly that's particularly special to you so it's it's funny you say song because i was thinking about sort of what do i like to do with my spare time when i when i used to play although piano is not um, an instrument you can't keep going back to Uh, but there's a song that it it doesn't have a, a lyrical component in terms of words but it's still one of my favorite songs I learned how to play early on um, when I was playing. And so it's a Mendelssohn's Venetian Boat. I don't think it answers directly the question you're asking. No, but no, I'm please answer, answer it. It's fine. I'm answering it the way I want to answer it, so you'll indulge me. But Mendelssohn's Venetian Boat song. So I still remember when, you know, you're, you're playing piano and you're learning how to put both of your hands together and play in unison. Um, and so it's this idea of like, you have these beautiful diminuendos and fortes and a clash of harmonies. And it's, you have on one hand, your left hand, a rocking boat that you're keeping going with this moody lullaby that overlays it. And um, it has always been one of my favorites. It's one I return back to when I, um, when I play. Um, but I like this idea of a rocking boat at night. We're out on the sea and, and sort of what's storming out there. It, it doesn't go at, at some point, it perhaps I'm going to have to pick a song with lyrics. But the truth is, and maybe this shows um, my own limitation. I had always wished I had a beautiful singer's voice. My mother um, used to sing for dance performances that my sister and I did. My sister has a similarly oh, wow. beautiful mm-hmm. voice. And I got my father's voice. And so I just I really shouldn't be singing um, unless it's a dark crowd and they're somehow muted out in their uh, ability to hear. <laughs> I'm so sure I that's unfair. I, no way. <laughs> I go with songs where I'm not required to sing, both for the benefit of myself um, and the audience at large. <laughs> well, no, no, no. That's amazing. No, well, look, I mean, I can't resist ending it by uh, by just giving you a because you you've been incredibly candid and gracious in answering that question. And I tell you, because when you said about your, your piano background, there are three people who, I mean, you know, I mean, I limit it to three who I think are just very special to me in terms of piano accompaniment. Uh, uh, One is Stevie Wonder. So (laughs) when, if you think about lately overjoyed, those sorts of songs that are piano led, um, John Legend, Ordinary People, and the third one that I and you know and this hits New York, Billy Joel, of course. Um, you know Piano Man. Um, so, but I could go on, but I'm not. But I'm just going to say that that in itself could, could be a podcast uh, subject about piano songs. So uh, it's often um, this but, idea, right? What do we what do we all like to do when we're not working? Um, which 
I think many of us have lots of things we like to do, or even things we learned um, early on, whether thanks to our parents or the access to it or whatever. But um, but I think about that a lot because people often ask, what are your hobbies? And I'm like, what mm. were my hobbies? Do we need to amend <laughs> yeah. the phraseology of it? Um, yeah. But uh, but I, I love your choices. Thanks for yeah. Thanks for sharing. No, no, thank you. And look, I've just, I've really loved doing this podcast with you, Rebecca. Thank you so much for being such a wonderful guest, being so expansive and enlightening in your answers. And uh, I look forward to seeing you soon in in an arbitration hot spot before too long and um, enjoying some good food and some good music with you. So thank you again very, very much. Thank you so much. It was really good fun. Arbitral Insights is a Reed Smith production. Our producer is Ali McArdle. For more information about Reed Smith's global international arbitration practice, email arbitralinsights at reedsmith.com. To learn about the Reed Smith Arbitration Pricing Calculator, a first-of-its-kind mobile app that forecasts the cost of arbitration around the world, search Arbitration Pricing Calculator on reedsmith.com or download for free through the Apple and Google Play app stores. You can find our podcast on Spotify, Apple, Google Play, Stitcher, Readsmith.com, and our social media accounts at Readsmith LLP on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter. This podcast is provided for educational purposes. It does not constitute legal advice and is not intended to establish an attorney-client relationship, nor is it intended to suggest or establish standards of care applicable to particular lawyers in any given situation. Prior results do not guarantee a similar outcome. Any views, opinions, or comments made by any external guest speaker are not to be attributed to Reed Smith LLP or its individual lawyers. All rights reserved.